I will present the results of uh, Work Package 6, uh, which had the aim to uh, support EU member states and joint action, part joint action partner countries in development operational intersectoral preparedness and response plan. And um, we did a work with a team, uh, which names are on the on the slide now. And I special I have to give special attention to uh, Sandra Kamga. She has been a driving force at all the work that has been done in our work package. And unfortunately, she was not able to give this presentation herself. So I'm doing that on behalf of her. Um, we have. Uh, performed work in four areas um, that I will um, involve you in. Um, first one is uh, to identify the sectors involved in the European public health emergency preparedness and response through a literature, uh, systematic literature review. Secondly, an uh, exploration on the European SARS-CoV testing landscape. Thirdly, uh, we investigated the citizens' role during public health, emergency and preparedness and response. And lastly, we investigated uh, what experts considered which sectors should be involved in public health, emergency, preparedness, response and recovery. To, um, yes, this is how it goes. To focus on the first uh, area, um, Multisectoral collaboration is something that internationally has been very much called for. We all know, as it is mentioned in the International Health Regulation, the SPAR and the JIE, it has uh, specific capacities uh, dedicated to it. Um, the EU decision 1082, which uh, nowadays is being uh, replaced by a regulation, and there is many uh, governance literature about it. Uh, we look. We did a an, an, uh, systematic literature review in defining what is multi-sectoral collaboration, which sectors are involved, and in what part of the preparedness and response cycle uh, they are involved in this collaboration. Uh, through a an, uh, an selection process, 94 articles uh, were included, and uh, that gave the following results. Um, we um, looked for sectors as they were mentioned um, in a um, amended list based on the European Commission list of sectors and economic activities. And out of those 28 sectors, there were four sectors mainly mentioned in the 94 articles. And as you can see, the vast majority was uh, on governmental institutions uh, secondly, human health industries, thirdly, experts, and fourthly, civil society. We also looked in which areas uh, in the preparedness plans or response plans they were, uh, the collaboration was mentioned. And for that, we took the seven domains of the preparedness and response cycle that we have developed for the HEPSA tool, for the ECDC. And um, this is too small, but on the left you see uh, the, the different sectors again um, uh, from up to down. So uh, the governmental institution, what's mentioned most is, is on the first place. And in the columns you see the different domains um, addressed in the preparedness and response cycle. And what we have seen is that mostly, if I can use the pointer, Is it coming? Oh, I can go like there. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Um, <laughs> so what we saw was that um, the most, mostly the the sectors which were mentioned in literature, they were addressed uh, in the colors uh, green and yellow in the areas risk and crisis management, pre-event preparations and governance and surveillance and least in post-event evaluation, capacity building, and implementation of lessons learned. And you can see these are more the heat or the active parts of response, while this is more in the, in the cooler phase the, where the preparedness uh, is done. So we su these results suggest that there is less of a focus on multi-sectoral collaboration during peacetime 
activities. So our final um, 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 recommendation is that there is a need for better conceptualization, but mainly also operationalization of multi-sectoral collaboration during public health emergency and response. The second study was an exploratory um, exploration to the testing landscape in a mixed methods methodology. Um, we all know that testing has been an, a major part of uh, controlling measures during COVID-19. And we also have to learn that within the EU there were different testing strategies, although uh, uh, the, the, the uh, scientific literature and the scientific base for those decisions, um, um, you might expect that that would have been the same. So we think we hypothesized that differences in the collaboration mechanism and structures or the lack of this mechanism might have influenced differences in the SARS-CoV-2 testing strategies. So what we did, we um, performed an online exploratory semi-structures online interviews um, uh, from, from which um, we um, uh, asked sharp partners to identify laboratory, policy making and public health experts involved in the development um, of these testing strategies and we conducted interviews uh, on 12 individuals from six European countries. These interviews um, we coded and we uh, themed them across uh, the Perkins framework for diagnostic preparedness and um, the number of times it was coded uh, as, um, from those interviews, uh, the coordination, accountability and governance was most frequently um, uh, named uh, during those interviews. Um, secondly, uh, we performed an online survey to explore which actors were involved in the development of those testing strategies. And um, we invited, uh, again, European IHR focal points and extraordinary national focal points for microbiology to uh, fill in this survey. And um, there were 12 actors possibly involved. And um, the outcome of 15 respondents, I will show you in the next slide. Um, um, on the left, you see those 12 sectors that were uh, identified and in the rows you see in different colors and that is maybe difficult to read but a different parts of the testing strategies uh, like as testing asymptomatic individuals uh, in green for instance uh, testing animals so what we learned from these um, and that there are um, main sectors interview or main sectors involved in the strategy like the ministry of health oh this is the wrong one. Yeah. The Ministry of Health, the National Public Health Institute, public health officials, and national expert and or advisory groups. And least were involved healthcare professionals and management of long-term care, which actually is a bit strange because there was also, it was very important also to test in those long-term care facilities. Um, commercial manufacturer of test kits an animal health laboratory. When there was asked whether these are the right sectors to be involved in the uh, decision-making strategy, the respondents um, uh, agreed and said, basically, uh, these are the, the right ones to be involved in that. So we come here to the final conclusion that um, when we looked basically further in in literature on uh, governance and multiple sector, multi sectoral collaboration, um, we think there is a lack of clear and uniform predefined collaboration mechanisms and structures ac across Europe. But secondly, if you want to improve that, it might be helpful to have experts um, involved who have an international link, for instance, uh, being part of professional associations on an international level. Thirdly, I will share with you uh, the, uh, the study we did in the European citizens' perception during COVID-19. Um, as you all know, the 
citizen participation has been much requested uh, for all kinds of measures uh, from vaccination testing to public health and social measures to even lockdowns and we studied which roles does the citizens and believe it should have um, for that we we have organized 16 focus group which were performed with the help of the other parties in sharp in four different countries among which finland slovenia spain and the netherlands and each country performed four focus group sessions in um, people with grouped among four age categories and those four fo in those four in those focus group sessions they also were recorded transcripted and analyzed um, we have um, uh, through this analysis basically we came to three um, themes that were important with this um, with this uh, citizen role the first theme was the citizens perceived role and uh, what came out very clearly is that they feel responsible to ha to adhere to measures it is however difficult for them to know how to prepare for that the second theme was the relationship between citizens and decision makers and um, here there was an important aspect of communication i think i'm losing this a bit so um and uh, the aspect of communication um, uh, it came across that um, at least in two of the four country studies that there was felt an authoritative style of communication by the government in general it was felt that decision making should have made more effort to come in contact with the, uh, with the citizens but in general they had a positive sentiment of trust in government's capabilities to deal with pandemics lastly there was the theme we have identified the citizen as information receiver um, in general there was a sense of saturation and information overload there were comments on the quality of information mentioning the large amount of unknowns and of contradictionary information at the end um, to finalize um, for this study the citizens mostly refer to their social responsibility to adhere to the measures as i mentioned but also they wanted to uh, get good information from the government and uh, to aim to understand the effects of their policies. Um, also, more attention should be paid to the quantity and quality of the information provided. Um, then I finalize with the last study, and that is basically following up the first study on the literature review, because we also, through a RAND modified consensus procedure, we ask as per experts what they think which sectors should be involved in the public health emergency preparedness response and recovery and for that uh, we performed an, a delphi study uh, evaluating the relevance of the 28 predefined sectors the same one as in the first study and also we um, we collected uh, from those experts uh, 10 recommendations and we wanted um, to um, uh, ask them if they uh, which of those 10 recommendations uh, should be uh, and how to incorporate this in the preparedness and response plan um, so we had an initial questionnaire to seek consensus we had a hybrid meeting in Malta on lessons learned regarding multi-sectoral collaboration and then it was followed by a second questionnaire crystallizing the judgments on sectors and recommendations um, in the initial questionnaire, 26 respondents for at least 12 countries participated. And in the second questionnaire, there were 17 respondents from at least 18 countries. Um, so coming back on which sectors uh, should be included. Um, in red, you see the four sectors that I already mentioned in the literature review. Human health industry, governmental institution, experts and civil society. But now there were also um, nine extra uh, sectors um, uh, uh, recommended, among which agriculture, ICT services, media communication, and um, the last one, personal service, administrative support, and re security, that was mainly 
um, identified for the response phase. Finalizing with um, recommendations on what and how. I think uh, this is uh, an, an, an important uh, uh, take home uh, message. Um, because all of those 10 recommendations were selected by the experts. So I will name them um, to get good intersectoral collaboration in national public health report emergency preparedness plans. It should include a communication plan between specifying those predetermined sectors, a network, um, I can better do like that, um, include contact details of those representatives of those predefined sectors, common goals, a common approach, include protocols concerning transparency between those se sectors with regard to, to decision making, establish a clear hierarchy, define activation criteria, designate an actor responsible for coordination, and lastly, to include a specific of a secure platform for cross-sectoral information sharing. So these all are building blocks for facilitating and ensuring intersectoral collaboration in the preparedness plan for good preparedness and response planning. Um, then the next question is, how can we integrate these sectors and recommendations in national preparedness and response plan? Um, before going to um, um, uh, the Mentimeter, in which I would like to uh, hear your ideas uh, uh, about this, I have one last um, remark from our work package. We are uh, working uh, on our last uh, delivery, that's um, developing a tabletop exercise on uh, high pathogenic avian influenza. And um, uh, we are um, in process to incorporate in this tabletop exercise a decision tool which sectors should be involved in this tabletop exercise. And um, we are very willing to hear if you or um, uh, colleagues of your are interested uh, in um, using such a tabletop exercise in the future, then please write us an email, ad an email so we can contact you and to see how you can uh, collaborate or contribute to um, um, uh, developing this tabletop exercise or what your expectations are for, um, uh, yeah, for a tabletop exercise to use it later on in your own country. Before I go to the Mentimeter, I'd like to ask whether there are any questions for clarification on this uh, presentation. Anna, shall I give you the floor? <laughs> Thank you, Corinne, very much. <clears throat> so let's have a look. Any questions for Corinne before we go to the Mentimeter, which will be also done by the Work Package 6? We have... Just a minute. Karen, please. Not, not a question, but a comment in support of Corinne's excellent presentation. I've just posted a link in the, in the um, chat for online participants to the page with the, all your videos and uh, thorough rundown of the work package yeah, six. Thank you. Work that might, be, that might be useful. Thank you so much, yeah. Thank you. And I just want to emphasize, I, I did not really mention it earlier quite clearly, but Work Package 6 is, for example, one good example how we were able to adjust our actions in SHARP towards to lessons learned from the pandemic. There were many work packages. It was quite hard for us as coordinators to really try to uh, adjust the, our work towards response better to COVID-19 whilst everybody were in the middle of pandemic. But for example, mm, we, well, yes, Work Package 5 did this very much the same. We were able to adjust our activities. Of course, it needed to be amended. And I don't know how many amendments did we do. Oti maybe remembers, fourth maybe, to really revise our work and our aims 
towards better to response to the current pandemic. But really, thanks for the, there's a lot of lessons learned from COVID in, in your work. Good, I don't see any hands and apparently there's no questions online either. And before we go to the Mentimeter, I'd like to introduce very shortly, you have the Mentimeter questionnaire and you are running it on yourself, but we have asked some commentary remarks for the Mentimeter from the ECDC. Maybe there are colleagues online or, or Svetla. And then we have, of course, also Bengt Scottheim here uh, with us today. Uh, and I'd like to just briefly tell about Bengt because he's a special advisor in the Norwegian Directorate of Health, the Department of Global Health. And um, currently, uh, Bengt is coordinating the joint action terror. Many of our sharp partners are, are with this joint action as well. And uh, Bengt has worked on global health issues for the Norwegian go government since 2009. And project manager engaged in the setup and management of Norway's efforts in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak response in 2014 and 15. And we have asked then Bank to comment on the Mentimeter. But with the Mentimeter, I will give floor again to Corian. Well, thank you, Anna. Um, so I hope it's, you all succeed to log in and also the people are online because they can they can share and also uh, um, uh, vote or, or give their opinion. And I see a lot of uh, thumbs up, so that's good. Uh, everybody online? Yeah? OK, then we go to the first question. So I have explained uh, and, and presented uh, um, information and, and uh, knowledge that we have learned in Work Packet 6. And um, now we are very interested looking in your own situation as participant in those four main sectors that were selected or that were basically um, came out of the literature review in the last study in the Delphi uh, methodology. How is the ability in your country to involve those sectors in preparedness, response, and recovery? And then you can select from one to ten, and and it's best to look and not at the results because then you get biased, maybe. It's interesting to see if we have the same the same um, representation uh, as we found in the literature review. And um, while people are still voting, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, will, uh, I will ask, especially the ones that are uh, difficult to uh, involve, to if, if people are willing to share experiences, why it is difficult. Um, so I think we are getting there a bit. We have now 54 respondents. I don't know, can we see how many have, uh, uh, have, have, have um, uh, included? Well, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, oh, it's okay, no problem. So maybe uh, one or vote come later, but then uh, regard giving the time, I will uh, I will say well, I think the the what we see is that basically the ability to most involve uh, sectors is the experts and the governmental institutions. What's more difficult is the human health industry and the civil society. So are people um, do people um, have examples or? Can they give a reason why they gave this low, lower score to share experiences in that? Or did people, didn't, is it something that you expect but didn't try yet? That is also possible. Tanya. Was when we 
originally they are planned we didn't really consider them much but it was obvious especially in my country i needed them a lot um to help with the migrant population to be able to get the message across to them and also to help the people in general when they were finding themselves in difficulties be it mental health who needed food who ended up homeless so yes now the lessons learned was that they ngos especially play a big part yeah so you've you've through through uh, um, through reality yeah. and through response exactly. you have you've learned uh, uh, the added value to incorporate them yes but you are still in the phase to to start it up exactly <laughs> all righty um thank you any other i see in my someone over there yes please yes hello christian berling from the minister of health in france um i haven't voted so but um <laughs> uh, i can just comment i mean it, the, with the general challenges to involve the civil society in such transversal endeavor actually uh, it's not a patient association it's not patient representative that you need to involve it's just representative of the civil society so um <laughs> any organization you have to determine if they really represent and what are the scope um, and what are the representativeness and this is our challenge we face this challenge on the joint action on vaccination because we don't want the anti-vaccines for example and and who i mean it's any citizen i mean who, who is i mean concern and this is the same i think with uh, with the shop and uh, all this uh, preparedness and um but we definitely need to involve i mean the people so that they just understand the measures that has to be implemented and adhere to the measures so but the challenges remain um, and I know that WHO is uh, currently preparing uh, some very interesting initiative to be able to involve uh, the civil society. But then the challenge will be how do you manage conflict of interest, potential conflict of interest as well. So it's a broad, broad I mean, question, the civil society involvement. Yeah, they're not so well organized as governmental institutions of human health industry organizations. That makes it also more difficult and indeed you don't it's a new st new patient population so you don't also don't have a structure to involve them in the, for instance the decision making process yeah thank you uh, any other opinions or experiences maybe about uh, the health human health industry because it's uh, surprising me a bit i thought that these would be maybe more easy to to Evolve. Can maybe someone share why he or she still find it difficult or has experiences? Okay, maybe it's still unknown. Um, I think we go to the next question of the Mentimeter. So I just explained uh, the, the 10 recommendations for tools in your preparedness plan to address. Um, and um, if, you, if you want to start uh, this afternoon after we have had a nice uh, dinner and you still feel motivated after these days and you think, okay, grab the moment, uh, what would be the first one that you think, um, I will give this priority because I think it's something that can be done easily or i'm already busy with it or i think this is really the most i think that is the the ones that i can best get uh, results from so common goals with your intersectoral uh, your your predefined sectors a common approach communication plans oh it's starting already now i'm lost But it's only one vote yet. <laughs> Protocols for transparent decision making.
and I leave you a bit because this is quite some thinking work with uh, 10 recommendations. And you might also uh, choose three. You don't have to select all of them if you think uh, I'm, I don't, I can't discriminate anymore. What time? Uh, because it was also bad. And we developed this question with our team because we thought by thinking about this. You already made a start. Okay, I think please uh, continue uh, uh, um, uh, answering, but um, I think there are not so major changes uh, anymore. Um, what the audience considers as most priority is uh, responsibility for coordination of multisectoral collaboration. And that's a very interesting one. Um, protocols, transparent decision making to define common goals, a platform, define activation criteria, and the others are considered less important. Um, I will go in the next slide to the responsibility. So I will focus a bit on the second one, the protocols, transparent, protocols for transparent decision making. Are, um, are participants having experience with making those protocols for transparent decision making? Yeah, Paula. <laughs> Thank you very much. What I see there, I, I think most of us uh, are on the public health perspective, uh, probably we were thinking, okay, if this is something under the health sector, so it's national public health emergency, you really need to define the governance of it. So all those two initial two first ones have to do with the generic governance of such a plan. And the way you do it, uh, it's of course defining those responsibility. And funny enough, number 10 should be also above there, because <laughs> it's where you clarify this is under the coordination of the health sector, where other sectors contribute. Because the coordination is from us. It doesn't mean other things don't have to be done by other sectors. And this is the most difficult aspect, because how do you make clear this kind of governance system under the health sector without an interministerial approach? So you can't do this just like that. And I go back to the, one of the first presentations we had today. Public health is political. It's more and more. And we cannot develop those things anymore. If we think we can, coma, think again. Because we, we, we need to have um, probably the specificity of something that is only health sector, or when it comes to other sectors, it belongs to a more intersectoral, interministerial kind of commission, whatever. So it's challenging. It, it, but the rest of the logic is fine. Because you just have to know the governments, you need to know the goals, you need to make sure how the information, uh, sharing of information established for circuit flow of, of information, because most of those will be uh, pre, during and after an event, so you need to make sure about that, and that's why activation, and the rest, the rest comes in, in, in a quite of sequential way. 
It doesn't mean that you, we will use all the same index, but the concept is there. You need yeah. to make sure where is the government of it, what is the goals, what are the circuits of information, and, and what are the criteria for the pre, during, and after. Maybe I'm, I'm, there are many, many things we, 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 we may need to, to use, but those ones we cannot run. The government's aspects, the first ones, needs to be clarified. That's the way I see it, but maybe I'm seeing it wrong. Thank you. Yeah. OK. William, I see you're oh. <laughs> raising your hand. Hello, Martin. Uh, Martin, thank you. My, I'm surprised, uh, but probably it's how we might, the nomenclature we might give to the plan. I mean, I work more in ports, in charge of ports and airports, and in my voting, your contact point, the details of your contact point is very important. Um, my question is, uh, I'm wondering why it's number nine, but in your preparedness planning, I would say it's good to know who and when to contact when there's an incident. Um, for us, uh, it, that helps with decision making, but you need to have contact points for your different yeah. stakeholders. Even when we were talking just now about uh, civil societies, I think it's good to, in your preparedness plan before, when you do your preparedness to identify who you will contact in your civil society, not anti-vaxxers, but pro-vaxxers. <laughs> yeah, Martin, I understand your point. Maybe uh, it is already there, and uh, maybe that's why it's not priority anymore, or maybe people can reflect while they gave it a low score. Well, it is quite a logic one to have uh, it in your preparedness plan. just a bit fall a bit down um, okay well also for the sake of the time um, Paula your your comments I was also um, positively um, um, uh, about the comment from the DG Sante during the panel that they will look with the results from work packets five and six what it can bring the next steps and maybe those building stones can help uh, to yeah to include in in guidelines or protocols to help member states uh, how to do that and also to have commitment from the governments and the different ministries uh, uh, to bring this uh, further because in these in this intersectoral collaboration uh, there are many sectors outside the health sector involved as well sorry yeah Thank you very much. I'm Maureen Boland from um, National mm. Health Protection in Ireland. I, mean, I think we can't underestimate the challenge of um, preparing or, or, or putting together a national public health emergency plan. It seems relatively simple on paper, but I, I would echo what Paola says about the, the, the particular governance and while we can do our plans for ourselves, it's the interoperability which always catches us. It's the communication side, it's the, it's the protocols, it's the, it's the interface of health and all the other uh, communities w who, with whom we work, which you've depicted there. So um, I think it would be very welcome to have some sort of steer on how this might progress so that we can have um, some sort of consistent approach across across member states in developing our national plans, which will also then, of course, help them become cross-border you know, plans also. Yeah, thanks. That facilitates the cross-border cooperation in that. Yeah. Okay, well, then I go to the last uh, 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 question. Um, well, I have to, I want to skip this. This is, uh, we don't, oh, it's, uh, I thought of it, there was another one. Oh, sorry. No. Well, then this is the end. <laughs> this was, I had a question on uh, what you, Paula, said. The first one, it is uh, who, who you think uh, needs to take the start uh, with, uh, with these uh, priorities and these recommendations. Um, but, um, well, um, uh, uh, we think, um, uh, Take it home and 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 reflect on it because I think for now uh, we leave it like this, um, and then I give the floor back to Anna. Thank you, Corian. And I, I think there are plenty of questions to be taken back home because these are really, as you mentioned, there was not much comment for the, for the uh, contact list. It's a small thing. Maybe people didn't vote it because they thought that it's not a big thing, but it's very crucial. So if you don't have it already, you should 
have it by now after pandemic. But very good questions. Thank you. Thank you for those. And now we have uh, commentary remarks from Bengt, from uh, Brent Scottheim, from Norway, and also from the ECDC. So please do have the floor here, or if you wish, you may take the seats over there as well, as you wish. Okay, thank you for introducing me. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation for us from Joint Action Terror to participate in the closing conference for Joint Action Sharp. Um, as the coordinator for Joint Action Terror, it seems to me that it's fairly clear that we're always benefiting from the experiences of Joint Action Sharp. Um, and not least due to the fact that we have uh, similar partners across Europe I see VP leads and co-leads from Joint Action Terror in the room here today, uh, and that's really nice because we are very closely related and linked as uh, technically in terms of uh, health preparedness in Europe. Just very quickly, I have to do this uh, so that everyone knows, uh, the objectives for Joint Action Terror are to address gaps in health preparedness and strengthen cross-sectoral cooperation between health, security, and civil protection in response to biological and chemical terror. Um, and not least, I have to give thanks to Auti and Anna for some very good discussions underway in terms of how to run a joint action. I know we've shared some issues and concerns over the time, and, and I think these uh, therapy sessions that we've had uh, along the way have been very, uh, very helpful, so thank you for that. So to the previous presenters, uh, I'd like to say thank you for excellent presentations today. Uh, it's been interesting to sit here, not having to be presenting, but can listen and learn. So that's very helpful. And I've been asked to assist with the start of a discussion on, um, on implementation. So I might ask you for comments. Uh, I know some of you in the room, so I might be like the, the mean teacher and ask directed questions. Uh, because if not, this will be a monologue from my side, and that might not be all that interesting. So, VP leads and so forth, sharpen your pencils. Um, in terms of questions, I think we can go back to what Andrea Amon addressed in her uh, speech earlier today, and that is on taking the outputs from joint action sharp, another joint action, and to introduce them into policies because that's not next natural step after production of of, of these uh, reports and results and from my point of view and i'm sure it's the same for Anna and Auti as well i'm sure it's something you think about quite often how to make sure that all these efforts have a practical output that they're possible to use whether it be my member states or from eu at the central level but this is uh, for, for me, at least, one of my main worries in running a joint action, that it's useful to the constituents in the national states, but also for EU citizens as well. And when we think about implementation, um, uh, I guess Virginia is with us online, EU, I hope, uh, mentioning her very quickly anyways. Handing over reports to EU is certainly one way to do it. Um, but uh, considering sustainability and implementation and one go, is the national setting, I think, is very, very important in terms of making sure that the outputs live on after the joint action. And so how to do that? Is it addressing it to your national directorate, public health institute, or ministry? Uh, those are relevant uh, ways of working. Um, and I, at least for our joint action, uh, I think that's something we will be pushing more in terms of achieving implementation and making sure that these outputs from all these efforts, substantial amount of work that's been done. Corian, I think your presentation was 37 to 40 slides. 
trying to summarize a report which is how many pages? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a long report. I haven't read the whole thing, but it's a substantial amount of work, and it's important that those efforts come into play in a way that's useful for member states. And I think it was an excellent way that you have done that in this presentation by listing very clear uh, points for following up. Issues that you have found throughout your review that are addressed in a way that it can be taken very quickly into a national discussion or an EU discussion on what's important, whether it be developing a national health preparedness plan or so on and so forth. Um, And you did the Menti, so I think we want to ask you back, because we didn't hear what you think is the most important output from your work. And I think that'd be really nice to hear, because you had 10 recommendations. Are there any, based on the efforts that you've done, that you think is like the key standout, or the, a couple of, of them that should be, be underlined, if you will? So not just put you on the spot, but you work on this, I'm curious to hear. Um, yes, it was, it's, a, it's an interesting question because in the first or the, the PowerPoint I made, uh, we sent in, it was still at the last slide, what is the next step for Dutch preparedness? Mm. <laughs> so I, I changed it during the lunch because, I, oh, sorry, that's, uh, I forgot to, uh, to adjust it. Um, uh, in the Netherlands, we are um, in a uh, good position that our ministry asks us to develop um, pandemic preparedness plans. Mm. So we were able to make a specific theme um, um, about uh, stakeholder analysis and um, basically to um, um, continue the outcomes of this work package. And uh, we feel very privileged about that uh, because um, 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 by addressing it spe specifically, uh, it has a better it has a better a chance for success. Mm. It's like um, horizontal or vertical themes or generic and specific preparedness. So. Um, by addressing it specifically, I think it has better chance. Um, so, um, what for us would be very important, as we say, the first step is to um, to connect with our Ministry of Health. I'm working at the RIVM, the National Institute of Public Health and Environment, but um, many sectors that are relevant um, is not. Um, are not the ones that we as institute have direct contact with. So all the themes like uh, what are the, the different um, uh, actors, uh, what role do they play, what are the responsibilities, um, this is something we have to do together with, with the ministry. And um, I think for that the outcomes of this work package helps. We also want to use uh, the, um, the monitoring and evaluation systems that are currently uh, in place, like uh, the SPAR or well, the, the Article 7 assessment that we get, where uh, we will, um, together with the ministry, um, look into um, what we do yearly, basically, which sectors are involved in which parts of the preparedness. But I think um, uh, for pandemic preparedness, um, uh, COVID has shown that it goes further and that um, it is something that our institute, together with the Ministry of Health, will uh, look into. And we were very happy that in the workshop that we organized uh, in uh, Riga with, uh, amongst others, the help from Indria, that uh, our ministry was present. Uh, so have to have a, a, common, uh, a common experience and common um, um, common view on this uh, um, importance of intersectoral collaboration. Thank you. That's an, I think it's an excellent response uh, with that connection with uh, ministries of health uh, and social affairs often 
are the key uh, key uh, contributors in terms of making sure that these uh, efforts are sustainable and are used at a national level. So I think that's a very, very uh, good response and something that we in Joint Action Terror certainly can take with us uh, into our uh, next steps as we start to produce more outputs. But I guess it's also about starting the dialogue with ministries at an early enough uh, time so that it doesn't come all the way at the end of the conference and then saying, oh, by the way, we have excellent outputs, but we haven't prepared the debates that needs to happen with the ministries. Am I, is it possible to ask uh, DG Sante a question? Are you with us, uh, Virginia? I think she's not online. Anymore. Oh, okay. Sorry, just a second. But we do have DG Sante on site, so if you would like to address this question to oh, Julia. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's even better than on, online. So your take on implementation of the outputs. It's on? OK, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm Julia from DG Sante. Um, nice to be with you today also physically. I'm actually a bit ashamed to say that I meet you all for the first time in person now at the end of the process. Um, yeah, so Virginia is definitely our preparedness expert. Um, I think we'll come back to it tomorrow during the discussion as well on sustainability. But one thing I would kind of like to flag already now is also making use of some of the existing tools like the Health Security Committee. Um, so you talked you know, about the different um, levels in your countries between the public health institutes and at ministerial level and well, cross-sectoral having engagement. But also I think one thing we need to do now towards the end is bring it to the Health Security Committee because this is definitely the best forum at EU level for exchanges for um, yeah, member states to continue the dialogue and also where the decision making will happen um, with the new powers that they've been given at HSC level for adopting uh, recommendations and opinions. So I think I, um, I mean, I think we'll do it in a more kind of structured way that we really have Joint Action Sharp come and present at the HSC, but I would definitely already encourage you to seek conversations um, within your country to kind of promote some of the outputs of Sharp. Yeah, I think. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, um, from the coordination team, Anna Alti, do you have comments from your view in terms of implementation? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Bengt. Uh, maybe I would take even two points here from the coordinator's point of view and then the national point of view because I'm also thinking of what, what we've been talking today and what, for example, the Ministry of Health, uh, Social Affairs and Health uh, highlighted today. Uh, of course, as we've talked today, and we have learned, and we will discuss definitely tomorrow more on the sustainability uh, panel, there's different levels, like um, the national, then the regional, even European, even global, and then, of course, the national implementation is one issue. From from maybe our point of view it's easier for maybe smaller countries such as finland and as mika also highlighted today we have quite uh, we have this whole of government approach in finland we have very or whole, whole of society approach in finland so it's maybe easier for us to contact our ministry of health than in many other countries we have already been working together for a long time. We have, for example, the uh, Security Committee, which is co uh, comprising of, of heads of the permanent secretaries of all the ministries. So they are all the time discussing about the security issues. So this is really giving us kind of the backbone for, for having the conversations between the ministries as well. And actually, I spot one person in the back row, and he's trying to look somewhere else. But <laughs> our chief of preparedness, Hannu Kiviranta, is also here. He has been involved in the, in the especially with the chemical work package in the in the beginning of the sharp. 
but he could maybe say one word about the pandemic preparedness plans in Finland in general, because we are about to finalize that with the Ministry of Health. So Hannu, maybe you wish to say one word. Okay, thank you, Anna. Yes, and indeed, the Finnish pandemic preparedness plan is is about to. F uh, yeah, well, it it is. It is written and it is under the uh, circulation to different uh, stakeholders, uh, in, uh, and, and we are expecting some comments for it. And the final plan is to to finalize it at, by the end of this year. Thank you. Yes, that's in short, and I don't know, I don't have any wiser advice than what Bengt has, that please do contact your own ministries in time, and not like, well, one, now we have three or four months to go, and it's quite late if we are now handing them over a nice paper, what we've done in Sharp, so really, I don't have any magic silver bullet how to do it, but nevertheless, the dialogue is the key, I think that's all. Yeah, I think uh, dialogue is the key, and it's it's also possible for us as a joint action that will likely continue for a bit longer to also uh, uh, bring forth the the gospel of joint action terror, no joint action sharp in our continued work as well. So that's also an avenue. I'm very much liking what <laughs> I'm hearing. So we are pushing all our our deliverables for you to. To sure. promote them. <laughs> I don't think we're, we're allowed to take on more work, but we can certainly uh, spread uh, information and make sure that uh, the outputs that come out of Joint Action Sharp are heard uh, through the meetings that we set up as well. And I know, because I have read some of the reports, there are excellent recommendations in the work of Joint Action Sharp, so I really think the efforts are have been really good, but it's also then to push so that we can get implementation of policies that you suggested. So uh, those are my comments, so thank you. <laughs>